This meeting is being recorded. Hey everyone, uh, we're super glad to have you here tonight. We're going to be talking about uh, scouting for quail, and I'm joined by um, two fantastic guests that know a lot about quail hunting and about quail. So I'm um, super excited to talk about that tonight. Just remember a few things that your cameras are off, you're muted, my TV turned on again. So <laughs> <laughs> I am at a hotel in the middle of North Dakota right now and technology is not being my friend. But anyways, your cameras are off, uh, you're muted, so don't worry about that. Um, if you guys want to chat, use the chat function down in the bottom corner. Um, that's just for just chit chat. And if you want to ask questions that Chad and Andy will answer, um, be sure to use the Q and A function, which is also down at the bottom of the screen. Um, and we'll try to get to your questions if you put them down there. Um, keep things simple in the chat. We're all just here to have fun. So. Uh, otherwise, if you miss some of this recording or you want to rewatch it, then uh, it'll be posted on YouTube tomorrow. You'll be able to look back and watch it. So um, without further ado, I'd love to hear in the in the chat here where everyone is from and we'll give it a few minutes, let some folks roll in here and then we'll uh, we'll kick things off. Wow. All over the place. I like it. Wow. Lots of Western ones. Oh, there's a Lexington, Kentucky, Alabama. So, Chad, where is uh, your where's your first stop for quail this year? Uh, first stop will be Nebraska. Uh, their their season opens next weekend, so I'm gonna. I live in the northern part of, of Oklahoma, so I can usually be up in Nebraska in about five hours or so. So I'm going to take a run up there this weekend. I've got some spots up there that I can usually find a few quail and, and see how I do. Excited to get the season started. I've been doing prairie grouse for the past month or so, and so I'm, I'm kind of ready to, to get going after quail. How about yourself, Andy? What does your season look like? Man, our season uh, here locally starts pretty late, most of the time due to uh, kind of limitations from deer hunters, um, which I am one of. I'll be out in the deer deer woods um, coming up starting this weekend. And so traditionally, we're not hunting quail down here until January, really, most of the time. And sure. so I'll head to Kansas a lot of times in the fall, mid-fall, and, and try my luck out there. It's kind of my traditional go-to. May get an Oklahoma hunt in this year as well. So, yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Um, well, it looks like we've kind of hit a critical mass of people, so we'll get things kicked off here. So, again, we're going to be talking about scouting for quail, and, and obviously this is a quite a complex subject, A, because there are six different species of quail, and B, uh, you know, you talked about the bobwhite, which is so diverse in its landscape. So, um, we are probably in the future going to have to dive deeper into each species just to give them what they need, but Tonight we'll kind of do a little overview about the different types of habitat um, that we're going to be looking for. So I'm joined by two fantastic people from Quail Forever, Mr. Chad Love and Andy Edwards. Um, if you guys want to uh, just give a, a 30 second spiel about what yourself about yourself and what you do with QF, that would be fantastic. So Andy, since you're up on the screen for me, I'll have you kick it off. Sure. All right, Ben. So Andy Edwards and I'm from Pulaski, Tennessee, and I actually get to live in my hometown. I've been back here about 16, 17 years and started with uh, Pheasants Forever up in Indiana back in 03 and um, coming up on 20 years. So when we started Quail Forever in 2005, I pretty shortly thereafter moved back home and covered the Southeast uh, for the organization as a regional representative up until a year and eight months or so ago and became the the program manager for Quail Forever, which is just mostly elevating our brand all across our, our corporate partners and our and our um, federal and state agency partners, just just singing the singing the good praises of Quail Forever and trying to work to to expand our brand. 
Awesome. Well, we're super glad to have you, Chad. Mm -hmm. You would do the same. Yeah. Well, my name is Chad Love, and I'm the, uh, the uh, editor of the Quail Forever Journal. And I've worked for Quail Forever for about four years now. And uh, I actually went, before I got hired, I went on a hunt in Alabama with Andy. That's the first time I, I met Andy uh, prior yep. to getting getting hired. Uh, I'm a lifelong Oklahoman. I uh, grew up in uh, Norman, Oklahoma, and uh, started quail hunting really when I was a kid. Uh, didn't really know what I was doing. I was just kicking up fence rows with no dog and and uh, a pair of tennis shoes and and uh, kind of got hooked on it and got my first dog in in college. It was a pointer bin. And uh, uh, after after school, I moved up to Woodward, Oklahoma, which is where I live now. And that's kind of the epicenter of quail hunting in Oklahoma. Um, a lot of public land around this area. And I worked as a uh, as a newspaper reporter for a while. And then in 2000, I decided to try my hand at freelance writing, did that for quite a while. Then after about 16 years of that, I got into the uh, into the, the editing world, was a book editor for a while, magazine editor. And I got hired by uh, uh, Quail Forever in 2017, I believe, and have mm -hmm. worked ever since. And uh, have a, a really good, uh, good fun time doing it. I, I enjoy my job. What what Chad's leaving out about that meeting is he caught about a seven pound bass about ten minutes after starting to fish on this yep. lake that was down there and uh, on, on your tackle from the bank with yeah. somebody else's tackle it was pretty yeah. impressive. Yep, <laughs> he's pretty That's fishy. Awesome. Very cool. Well, I'm excited to have you guys on tonight. Um, and kind of what I'm going to do first is I am going to, if you're, you know, a lot of you obviously are familiar with Onyx because you're here. So, but what I'm going to do is I want to give you guys a, a quick breakdown of kind of what I have on when I'm, when I'm using the product and then also kind of a, a general strategy that you can use um, just to get yourself in the game. Um, and these, these tips with Onyx can be used um, you know, the species doesn't matter. It's kind of the process that matters in terms of finding different areas. Um, so I'll go through that quick. Uh, we'll break down the product and then we'll start jumping into species. So I'm going to share my screen here. Uh, can every guys, can you see my map? Is that up there? Yep. yep. All right. Perfect. So I'm on, I'm on Onyx Hunt, the web map right now. I mean, if you're not familiar, obviously a lot of you use it on your cell phone, but we also have it on the computer. And this is where I do a lot of my scouting, uh, just because you have a bigger screen. Uh, I'm on the computer all day anyway, so it's easier for me to navigate. Um, so I do my scouting on here and then I take it into the field with my cell phone. Now in saying that, uh, if you want to do it on your phone, great. You've got all the tools, all of you have at it. It's great. I just prefer to use this. So um when we talk about quail there's depending on which species um all a lot of your good stuff is going to live within the map layers if you look right here hunt map layers um each state for example we if you if you have elite you have access to all 50 states um you're going to want to flip on layers for different states um pretty much the layers that i always have on are your private lands layers, government lands, and then as well as walk-in access hunting. So depending on the state you're hunting, Kansas, for example, Weehaw, um, if you're in North Dakota, Plots, Nebraska is this open fields and waters. And this, depending on the state, is going to open up a ton of access for you. I know Nebraska is huge. Um, you can see the amount of public land you're really limited to, like a few areas, but then you throw on this open fields and waters layer and it really changes the game for you so um those are the layers i am going to use most of the time now getting into some other things uh we'll be talking about this later tonight but waypoints i religiously use waypoints because i have a terrible memory so um I am going to use waypoints all the time when I'm scouting, when I'm looking for things, uh, as well as once I've went and hunted and confirmed there's birds there or there's not birds there. So, um, and I also always use icons. So if I, I never, I hardly ever use just the red X because a lot of the times my map looks disgusting and I would have red X 
X's everywhere and I have no idea what anything is. So I always label my waypoint with icons as well as uh, I'll, I color coordinated them and I can go into that later as well. Um, a lot of the times if it's something I want to remember, I'll, I'll add in a, either a waypoint name or I'll go down if I've hunted a spot and I can leave a few notes here, whether it's kind of, you know, what the conditions were, et cetera. So um, those are two things you're going to be using a lot. We're going to be talking about here um, as well as our, our base maps here. So when I am pretty much when I'm bird hunting anything, I'm going to be using the hybrid layer, which has both contours and as well as um, aerial imagery. So you can kind of see, we're going to be talking about a lot today about uh, looking at the landscape and being able to tell what that looks like. Does it look like good quail habitat from the air and how does that translate to the ground? Because um, that's going to be very important. Another cool feature here in web map is 3D. So you'll get a, you know, if you're not great at looking at contours or, I mean, to be honest, sometimes I have a really hard time like, okay, what is this doing? What does this look like exactly? So we'll be using 3D as well. And within that, there is this 3D exaggeration. And what that does is that is going to um, kind of Are we losing Ben? Yeah, I think so. He went uh, Mr. Roboto on us there a little bit. He'll <laughs> he'll be back. Uh, they'll pipe in some more internet from from nowhere, North Dakota, here in a minute. Hopefully, maybe his TV took over. It's I think maybe over. his TV went back on, and it's and maybe a maybe it's a Wi-Fi TV. Still yeah, there's not enough power to power both the Wi-Fi and the uh, TV there. <clears throat> but, you know, I thought it was interesting. He was talking about the 3D exaggeration. I found that really useful. I Not a not a quail hunt, but just got back from a, a grouse hunt. And I have that same trouble sometimes, especially in fairly flat land. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it really helped. It really helped a lot just to be able to see kind of like, oh, this looks good. But, oh, yeah, not going down in there. It's, you, you know, 100 feet down and in a tiny spot. So, um we're gonna we're gonna try to talk different quail species, and um, it looks like there's a lot of folks here from the from the west. And so let's maybe launch off into some some western quail species, particularly that southwest um, you know aspect of it, and talking merns and scalies and and gambles. Um, Ted, I know you and I both went on. We did. We weren't there. Actually, we did overlap a little bit last year out in Arizona, but we went, we didn't get to hunt together. But, um, you know, particularly for Merns, I, I found Onyx to be super useful um, and and was able to really ferret out some patterns pretty quickly um, with birds, you know, last year. Both, you know, the aspect that they were on and the cover type, um, kind of even where on the hillsides we were finding Merns, I thought that was useful last year. Yeah. Yeah, I uh, I went out there last year, and uh, I probably couldn't have found birds without it. Uh, yep. You know, it's it's one of those tools that uh, uh, that I I you know I I went on a hunt with Ben last year in Kansas and uh, described myself as an adult onset Onyx user, and that's yeah. what I still am. But uh, I'm a quick learner, and I'm learning that I uh, I depend on it a whole lot more than I ever thought that I would. And uh, uh, hunting Merns quail was was definitely one of those one of those uh, instances where I did, I, right. I think I'm back. I'm back. The hamsters must have been running a little too slow over here. No. Nope. Windy, North Dakota. So, <laughs> all right, we'll see how it goes. But anyways, um, so I want to get into uh, some quail species now. Um, so there are six species of quail in, in the United States here. What uh, what are those six species? I'll let the biologist answer that one. Oh, gee, thanks. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna go with the I'm gonna go with the king, Bob White, first, uh, and yeah, because I live in Tennessee, that's an easy one to check off. But Bob White scaled 
um, Gambles, Merns, Mountain, and and Valley are California. They're the same same bird. So I think that's counting to six. I got a I got a Tennessee uh, public school education. Hopefully that gets me there. <laughs> I think you got them. So right. let's start. Let's start with uh, let's start an overview on Bob White's here. Um, let's talk first. Let's talk about range because I touched on briefly before. Um, these birds are pretty incredible in the fact that they range from Florida all the way to Iowa. At one point, they were dang near everywhere, yep. and then obviously out out towards Chad's neck of the woods. So, yep. um, eastern Colorado up to up to at one time, like you said, they were in New York. I mean, they were you know present there, present in Michigan uh, at times, and a lot of talk about why that's not that the case anymore, but. Certainly habitat loss is the number one key, but then winters of 77, 78 were huge for the Midwest, the Northern Midwest uh, quail populations to get more and more separated and then knocked out. But yeah, man, I, you go from, like you said, Florida, uh, you're hunting a bird in the, primarily in the pine woods, uh, what we think of as kind of that quintessential South, you know, Southern quail hunt to Texas brush country to the plains in Oklahoma and Kansas. So um Really, really diverse bird, uh, probably the the widest diversity of range that they're found in. But there are some there are some kind of um, similarities that you're going to find. Chad talks about sand plum a lot, and I've had some sand plum jelly I think that he makes. But you know, they're in they're in scrub cover. They're in they're not just out on the grass plains. Uh, you know, it looks like a pretty homogenous landscape, but it's keying in on areas that are brushier. Um, and and really focusing on those um a professor that i've um, talked with quite a bit greg harper refers to them as a shrubland obligate uh they're they're they have to have some brushy cover i i couldn't help it i had to i it know in. i was about to say you had to use that word i couldn't help it uh but they're you know we call them a grassland bird but really they're a, they they are tied to shrubby cover of some sort some type of woody cover uh in the in the pine woods in the southeast, they are only there because it's easy to burn that landscape very often because of the pine needle cast. But when when trees on the landscape get thicker, then let's just instead of ca- talking basal area, let's talk percent cover. When the, you get more than forty to fifty percent trees on the land, you're not going to have quail not not at high densities. It you know a a treeless landscape can support quail much easier than one with trees. And so if you look across a broad, like state by state in the Southeast, you'll see that a lot of those areas have grown up in trees or houses or, or fescue fields uh, around where I'm at and our suitable cover is pretty low. And so being able to find suitable cover with brush with, you know, you know, think, six to eight foot tall right now sumacs are flaming red here in tennessee and they're a a great quail species uh and it's it's a little tough sometimes to see those on on x um to to be able to see that shrub component uh in there but you can look for timber cuts on especially on um public land for like national forest in the southeast or anywhere there's a whole that new timber cuts layer is great and looking at timber cuts that are less than five years of age and targeting those because that's going to mean more sunlight and that's going to mean more quail. So that's yep, my bot exactly. white spiel. Yeah, so I am gonna I'm gonna try to give the old I'm gonna try to share my screen again here and show um, you know just like a lot of a lot of upland birds obviously quail are also, you know, they require that diversity. So um, here's a spot down in, uh, in the South that I've hunted before. And you can see here that there was like, they were, there was some logging here. Um, this is probably, oh, I think like uh, Ace, uh, at this picture is probably, it's showing like maybe three years old, but now it's probably five or six years old. Um, there's a good understory in this forest and then out here you can kind of see like if you can pick up on on all the little woody shrubs um, there's a few little shelter belts kind of running through there Um, 
so this is like this is probably one of the better areas for quail i've hunted in the the southeast it's a mix of pine and hardwoods um mm. and one great way to tell that if you go into your map layers here um you can go and turn on um coniferous versus deciduous and it'll show you yep. okay which areas like this is deciduous you've got some of this this is actually showing mixed which is actually probably true um so you can just see this this patchwork this different mosaic of cover and which creates a lot of different edges for those birds so this is a great example of uh, a, a area that that is going to look pretty quaily to me um, another yep. thing is you can see you can look in in between these trees here and you can see uh, actually the ground um, so that means it's getting sunlight down to the 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 forest floor which is obviously going to encourage uh, some growth underneath there so those are things that i'm looking for when i'm hunting the southeast yep and i think oftentimes especially in areas that are highly pressured and it goes for the plains as well but those areas that other people aren't willing to go are huge and and often in the southeast it can mean the really rough stuff it can mean briars it can mean a little farther from the truck um but that's that's a huge component of how you know i'm finding birds on on ground that's not designated maybe as a quail area but it, it's public land and you're able to to just you know put on some some miles and 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 wear those chaps out a little bit but you'll find birds back in there yeah and and, and so a lot mm -hmm. of the times what i would do in in this was in mississippi for example um just because it's a lot of the times it can be a needle in a haystack, right? Oh yeah. So I would I would go walk a lot of uh, a lot of logging roads, a lot of forest roads, um, and I'd walk and listen and and run the dogs and even drive around sometimes, right, until I saw them. Because depending, you don't know. I mean, heck, you could be walking for days without seeing birds especially in those areas that aren't, you know, designated quail areas. Right. Um, until I start, would get it, start to get into birds. And then I would, you know, okay, this is what this looks like. And then the big thing is replicating that. So, okay, yes. this is what the habitat looks like. And then I would go and continue to find different areas yes. that look like that. Yeah. I think that that's the biggest thing for me is that replication of effort, even year to year you're using on X to validate like, okay, this conditions last year, they were here. Let's check it. Let's check this spot first and see if they're, you know, if that still is true for this year and often it is, and you can accelerate your, your success pretty quick. Now, Ben, yeah. hunting in, in Mississippi, did you find that when you were, you were recognizing those patterns, uh, can you, did you transfer that recognition to other areas, like to other states, other regions, because, you know, and, and uh, I don't want to sound like a biologist, but, you know, it's like a quail, as long as their conditions are met, you know, food, cover, water, uh, they, they'll they thrive in areas that don't look like what you were seeing in Mississippi, because I, I see that a lot in Oklahoma, you know, guys will come out here, people will come out here and, and hunt, and they they won't recognize those those conditions, they won't recognize, you know, those areas because they don't look like what they look like back home. And I think as long as you recognize cover as cover, even though it may not look like the cover you're used to, you'll be okay. And, you know, some people yeah. kind of get into that trap of trying to like find stuff that, that, that looks familiar to them. Oh, I, I have a perfect segue there for Merns. I did that last year. The first day I was hunting stuff that I thought looked great because I'm used to 70 foot trees and a lot of you know thinking about them on the landscape it's it's different i'm looking at 20 foot tall gamble oak and other stuff but we were hunting into the cover we were hunting was actually too thick and the second day we were hunting really open landscape with quite a bit of grass and some shrub cover and found birds and just thinking back on it if i would have just stuck to that this is too thick for for quail period 
um, we would have been way more successful that first day. Yeah, because that that is a great that's a great call out because regardless, uh, I think regardless of the species, like having um, percentage of bare ground is very important, uh, yes. especially nesting. Right, the young birds need that yeah. to be able to get around. So um, if there's pheasant hunters out here, like if you are in pheasant type habitat where it's thick and like matted that is not going to be good quail habitat you want areas where they're able to move underneath um, and run around because that's how they spend most of their day correct yeah. yeah it's it's very rare to find you know quail in that thick of a cover and i think they could get pushed into there occasionally but even where i'm talking about where it's too i said too thick to walk that it's open yeah. on the ground it's it's most of the time briars or some really brushy cover but not often a mat of grass very very yeah. uh, few times is that the case and um yeah if 30 percent um bare ground is really really good for particularly bob whites but but all those quail species they they thrive with an area that has overhead cover but a travel corridor underneath yeah for sure so let's let's transition so from from so quail in the southeast chad kind of what are you you know, when we get into the Great Plains states, kind of uh, give an overview of what you are are looking for when out hunting quail. Yeah. So, yeah, so it, it's a little bit different out in, in my part of the state where I live versus, you know, in, in other parts of the state. You know, I live in kind of like the the, the wide rolling sand hills region, uh, but, this, but the same basic, you know, requirements remain the same. Uh, I'm looking for like what but, uh, oh, did we lose Ben again? I think we did. No, no, he's just sharing a screen. You know, I'm, I'm sure. looking I'm looking for, um, you know, sh shrubby cover. I'm looking for um, transition zones. I'm looking for that mosaics of, of you know, open bare ground and, and overhead cover. And uh, uh, if I can find those in, in the right ratios, those are the areas that I work. You know, I, I try not to hunt like monoculture areas uh, try not to hunt real thick CRP fields. I'm looking for, like what Andy said, that stuff that offers some overhead cover, offers you know plenty of weedy forbs, and offers uh, bare ground underneath that they can that they can run. You know, I very rarely find quail in like very thick matted cover, uh, and so that's what I basically what I look for uh, when I'm looking for quail out here. You know, sand plum thickets interspersed with with grass. Yep. And so an example of like something like that, what you'd be looking for, if you look out in the middle here, like this is more or less a sea of grass here, but then you get over here, you know, you can start to see those, those change in colors on the map. And like, these are going to be sand plum thickets. Yeah. Sand plum uh, thickets. Another thing that I look for, and I, I don't know if I can see it on this, this particular piece, but you know, especially out here when you, when you get low areas, that it collects, it has a little bit different biome to it, you know, cause it, it's a, it's got a little, it collects a little bit more water. And so the plant community is a little bit different. You know, you sometimes you'll find, you know, like ragweed and croton and uh, you know, prairie sunflowers and things in these areas that are, you know, that they don't look all that much different from the surrounding area, but that's edge cover, you know, and that's a, that's a, that's a break. And I, I will find birds in anywhere where there's a break between two, two different habitat cover, you know, two different types of, of habitat. Yeah, yep. I think yep. that's a huge point because we, we often look at them in the east as a quote edge species, but they're not, but they, they, it's all we give them a lot of times is that edge of the field, but they're often found in a transition zone between let's say brushy cover and, and weedy cover or uh, yeah. even brushy cover and, and tree cover, but they're very close to that transition zone. Yeah. When I first moved out here in, in this part of the state and the first time I went out quail hunting here, I, you know, I was used to hunting, you know, field corners, fence rows, you know, that mm -hmm. the kind of classic quail habitat that I read about as a kid and saw in the magazine. Well, I moved out here and I, I, I was staring at mile after mile of rolling sand hills, you know, full of sand sage. And so I didn't really know where to start, you know, because it, it looks so different to me. But over time, I started recognizing you know, I just start walking. And of course this was pre-onyx. So I'd keep a little journal and I just, I'd mark where I found cubbies, you know, 
And, and pretty soon I started seeing a pattern and then I started, I, I applied that pattern to what the land actually looked like. And then I started noticing these transition areas. You know, I, I, I'd rarely find quail out on a, like a, a, just a flat monotone or monoculture flat of, of sand sage, uh -huh. but I'd find them in those areas that had a lot of sand sage, but it also had other little plant communities. And, and it was just that, you know, the, once you start looking, uh, an area that looks like it looks the same, it has quite a bit of diversity to it. You know, you just, you just have to start noticing those more subtle transition zones. Yep. And the other thing that I, uh, you know, for me, when I'm hunting, whether that's Nebraska, Kansas, is uh, crops. So again, like that is a fantastic food source. Obviously there's some areas that don't have crops, but um, you know, small grains, are are pretty key what i'm looking for so um i'm going to share my screen again here and i'll kind of show you another trick here so if you haven't used this um if you go into your layer library um and scroll down here oh that's not the right one i got so many layers on uh <laughs> Trees crops cover, same one that you'll find your 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 forest. You can turn on or your forest types, you can turn on this crop distribution. We have 19 different layers. So you can kind of see here, you can see corn. This was planted. So again, the caveat to that is this was last year's data. Um, but when you're looking for an area in general, you'll kind of be able to see what those crops are composed of. So, you know, if you look in this example area for example you've got some soybeans corn winter wheat um and a diversity there. sorghum sorghum's a good one right so um this will at least get you in the right area to try to figure out if you're going on a trip or something um, what you're most likely to find in that area so um you know i'm hunting a lot of a lot of sorghum uh a lot of wheat field edges uh sometimes corn so that's uh, that's another good tip to use to um, to find birds. Yeah, that you you showed me that layer last year when we hunted in Kansas, and uh, I'm really looking forward to using that this year. I think that's a fantastic tool. You know, mm -hmm. and the the uh, the historic fire layer is another one that I I really want to start using a lot of because I think that's that one would be a really good one, especially for for quail. <clears throat> one one thing on that is important. I think is that those layers are all the way at the bottom. They're not within each state. So that one got me a couple of times. I'm like, where's it at? And then, oh, wait a minute. It's all the way down under under its own, the food crops and cover. Yeah. So. Or trees crops. And then and especially cover. if you're hunting, if you're a public land guy, uh, like most of us are, um, you know, just finding, it easily identifies where fields are next to pieces of public ground. So that's, that's a lot of the times what I'm using for, I don't, you know, not, I don't necessarily care what's in it, but just the fact that, okay, there's this bright color next to uh, a piece of public land. Yeah. You know, especially in, in places like Kansas with, you know, a, a, a big wee haul program, but also a lot of ag, um, you know, when you find those, those areas, those low areas, again, you know, those areas that can't be plowed or can't be, you know, can't be put into production that are in, enrolled in, in Weehaw surrounded by, by crop fields. Mm -hmm. uh, those are the areas that I really key in on when I'm, when I'm looking for places to, to quail hunt, you know, whereas, whereas, you know, pheasant hunters may, may look for CRP fields surrounded by crop fields. I'm looking for, for native prairie or old residual native prairie that uh, surrounded by crop fields specifically for quail. Yeah. I remember once yes. we found, it so was here, a, I, go ahead. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah. So like here is a, a prime example of what I was talking about. Here's a, a piece of Weehaw ground. Um, and this is something that I personally would, would definitely hunt. You can see you've got what last year was corn. So most likely won't be corn. But then you look on this map and what you're seeing is you're not seeing just a sea of grass, right? It's not all one single color. You can see that you've got some darker colors, which indicates going to be a little bit thicker cover. Um, lighter colors are going to indicate it's going to be less thick, but you can see this patchwork, like here's some thickets in here, um, probably some trees, but there's these little patches of cover 
all through here. And like this would, this looks like it would be a dynamite coil area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's exactly the kind of stuff that I'm looking for. Uh, you know, and, and what I've started using on X4 uh, is finding those areas that where I can look on the screen, you know, on my phone and, and look at areas that, you know, again, going back to that whole mosaic patchwork kind of metaphor there, uh, find those areas that with those, those little patchworks of, of varying shades of, of brown and green that differentiate between varying, various thicknesses of grass and various covers. Yeah. Um, well, it looks like, you know, again, these species are all so we could, we could dedicate an hour to each one of these quail species. We've been talking a lot of Bob White. Um, we are going to have to, we'll probably in the future have to dive, we'll deep dive on each one of these species probably in future webinars. But um, let's, for the sake of time, let's maybe transition to a lot of guys here looking for uh, desert quail, whether that's, you know, merns, gambles, et cetera. So um, let's just head a little bit, a uh, little bit further west and, and maybe tackle Chad, you want to tackle us through scalies first? Yeah, I, I mean, I suppose, of course, we have scalies in Oklahoma here too. So, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm used, yeah. to, used to hunting them here in Oklahoma. You know, you go a little bit farther west and the, the terrain and the vegetation is a little bit different. Um, I've noticed, you know, in, in New Mexico and in Arizona, uh, it tends to be a little bit thinner cover than what I'm used to here in Oklahoma, like I, in, in Oklahoma, I'm hunting basically the same places I find Bob Whites. Uh, you know, out in the far Western Panhandle, you start getting into, you know, San Sage and Choya. Uh, Choya. And in, in New Mexico, I, I, I try to key in on, on grass, grass with interspersed with like mesquite and, and Choya and, uh, and, and with water, you know, and, and it seems like scalies key in a lot of times on uh, any type of vertical structure they seem to be attracted to that kind of stuff. Like here in Oklahoma, I'll hunt, I'll hunt tank around tank batteries a lot. And out there, I've noticed, you know, old old farm machines, you know, sort of like the whole whole Hunstead thing that Ben Williams talked about with with Hungarian partridge, kind of holds true a little bit with scaled quail too. I've I've found them in I've seen them in like junked cars and and you know old farm implements and stuff like that. So when I'm when I'm hunting New Mexico, I'm looking for for areas of you know large contiguous areas of you know, decent grass interspersed with mesquite clumps, choya, and also water sources. You know, I find a lot of scaled quail around water sources and in draws that may have a little bit more uh, chance to have some water in them or stock tanks, uh, things like that. So for us uh, Easterners, when you're saying water sources, I mean, it could be a, a dried up creek bed with just a puddle here and there, right? I mean, you're not, you're not finding a lot of. Well, so uh, I, I will typically find that's kind of like the, the area where I'd find more gambles quail, like, like, okay, you know, like, like gambles quail seem at least to me anyway, in my experience, like they, they occupy like that gnarly, thick, dry kind of, you yep. know, like, like really thick stuff yep. and the scale quail, a little bit more keyed in on open grassy areas interspersed with that shrubby cover. Okay. Uh, so with like with gambles quail, like, you know, when I, like the first time that I hunted New Mexico, I, uh, I was looking for, for gambles quail. I didn't really know where to start. You know, when I go to an area, I always try to, before I hunt with someone who knows the area, I always try to kind of see if I can figure it out on my own. And, uh, and I was really striking out on gambles quail in New Mexico until I, you know, looked on Onyx and found, you know, found an area that had a, a draw on it. You know, it had a bunch of brushy cover and a draw. And uh, and that's where I found gambles. And I don't typically find scalies in that type of habitat. I find them more in like the open bench type areas or, you know, that a little less rugged than what the gambles quail occupy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and one great tip, if you are, you know, if you're want to go travel, a lot of people, you know, in the winter want to go Arizona, New Mexico, um, great resources are, you know, state agencies just to get, at least get you dangerous, right? Because like yeah. there's certain areas of the state, like for example, Murrins, like if you are way far, like, oh, I want to go to Arizona and you're in way northern Arizona, like they're just not necessarily there, right? So, you know, and that's a really good point. You know, it's like, and, and 
it applies to Oklahoma too, because I will run into a, Oklahoma is a destination spot for a lot of out of state quail hunters. And I will run into guys out hunting who, you know, and I, I strike up conversations with them because that's what quail hunters do. And I, I've been surprised by the number of times I'm, I've run into people who initially, who who found the spot that I'm hunting or the area that I'm hunting, which is Western Oklahoma. But for whatever reason, they just, they they think they, they connect Oklahoma with quail, but they tried WMAs in the Eastern part of the state, which I'm not saying that there aren't quail in the Eastern part of the state, but if you, if you travel to a state to hunt quail, or like if you travel to Oklahoma, Typically speaking, you're going to want to travel to the western part of the state, you know, rather than the eastern part of the state. Yeah. So there are, it's a perfect, it, that's a great point because a lot of people will go to a state thinking that there's quail basically, you know, all over the state when that's not really the truth. There are certain parts of a state, you need to do your homework before you actually go to the state and expect to find right. birds where they may not be. Well, and then just to plug the, you know, Quail Forever's forecast just came out a week or two ago and it's, it's pretty good about kind of directing you toward a certain area of the state in most cases because that that's huge to know the, the difference um same thing with let's say tennessee you're not going to find a whole lot of quail in east tennessee you you find some in middle but you're you're more likely to find birds in in west tennessee and alabama it's going to be south alabama or middle or central you know but yeah it's um it's not all across the board and the public land component which is pretty very easily available on on x is huge. Um, with that, though, I would say, Ben, you were pointing out Weehaw areas in Kansas earlier. And, and one thing I did wrong at first was target those huge WMAs and try, and the Weehaws around them. Well, I found out that that's what everybody else does, too, you know, and that was a little tough, uh, but it was a learning curve. And then just but but having the confidence to branch out on your own and and check out those tiny areas is. Yeah. And so stuff yeah, out of the way it's good yeah basically the, the way that i approach hunting a different state is just you know kind of like start out with the macro and uh find out you know where within that state those birds are most likely to be and then start uh looking at things like the forecast you know see how how rain falls see how the winter went see how the hatch is going and then kind of like winnow out all these possibilities that are low, lower percentage possibilities and then you're left with a handful of places or regions that offer you the best chance to find birds for the least amount of, of time and effort. Right. And, uh, and then I concentrate on those areas and then kind of like dive down from there. I feel like too, and I think I can say this pretty much across the board that, that the quail coordinators for each state aren't used to having a whole lot of conversations with people, maybe in certain states they are, but the, the wildlife managers on certain areas or the wildlife biologists for each state uh, you know, shoot them an email and they're typically really good about getting back to you and at least having a conversation about, well, hey, you shouldn't, you shouldn't waste your time here. You might want to go there, that sort of thing. And it's, it's worth, it's worth finding their email and, and shooting it to them, I think. 100%. Yeah. Like just to utilize all those resources you have at your disposal, if you're looking, you know, to travel, um, I've, I've called them before. And it's, you know, it's definitely put me in the ball game when sometimes it would be like, oh, my first instincts were not correct. I'd give them yeah. a call. They were always helpful um, when I was with going out of state. So, and, um, yeah, go ahead. They want you to be successful. I feel like that's been a little bit of a, um, a shift, you know, in the past eight or 10 years is that, you know, our state agencies want hunters to be successful and they want them to enjoy it and, um, and I think they're they're doing all they can to kind of provide that experience for you. Yeah. Um, so so transitioning from Scaly, let's go. Let's just maybe hit gambles uh, here quick. Uh, Chad, would you want to give a little breakdown on kind of what what you're looking for in gambles and how that differs? Yeah. So so basically, and I don't know if if the Arizona and New Mexico hunters can commiserate with me on this, but if I want to find gambles quail, I look for areas that hurt me. Uh, mm -hmm. That just like thick, you know, choking, you know, cactuses that grab you, like really thick, rocky areas. Like the first gambles quail I ever shot in New Mexico was I shot in a like this really th like boulder strewn draw. You know, I I, uh, I I was looking on Onyx. I had no no idea where to go, and uh, and I was I I just found an area. Yeah, I just found an area that looked 
well, hell, it looked almost exactly like that. <laughs> yeah, um, that's it. <laughs> It was just a, it was a wash, you know, basically just a dry wash. And up at the head of that wash, you know, that the, it was a BLM piece of property. So it had a grazing lease on it. There was a stock tank there. And uh, I, I just started off from that stock tank and I just started walking down that wash. And I, you know, Choya and Devil's Claw and 10,000 different kinds of plants just all just wanted to puncture you. Uh, and that's what I found Gamble's quail in. And, you know, it was, it was kind of painful, <laughs> but I found birds in it. And, uh, and that's typically what I find a lot of my gambles quail in, you know, I'll find in, in areas like that. Uh, and I'll find scalies, you know, out on those areas around it that have, mm-hmm. you know, mesquite and, and a little bit more grass. Uh, it seems to me that, that gambles seem to be more of a, of a bird that kind of keeps in more on brushy, you know, brushy, more, more thicker stuff than what the scalies do. Yeah. And even yeah, sometimes and- you're finding them on the same hunt, but maybe like you said, in a little bit different, benches, yeah. Up on the benches, yep. Yeah, and, and you know, gambles. If you've ever spent time in Arizona, like they have adapted themselves very well to, um, you know, I guess it's like suburban areas, even. Yeah, very much like, a suburban bird. Yeah. So, so you know, you go on a golf course down there, and they're you know running around everywhere, right? So, like, you don't have to necessarily get super far away from from cities etc um because they'll they'll be right on the outskirts of town and and same thing like i was talking for for um bob whites in the south i spend a a fair amount of time you know just kind of maybe cruising the roads and the cool thing about gambles is you know i'll you'll you can sit and listen for them yeah right and i've found a lot of good areas what i'll just drive around turn off my truck sit there for, you know, half hour, maybe walk around a little bit and just listen for them. Yeah. And that's what I do with, uh, with Bob's too. It's like w- one of the most effective ways of finding out what real quickly, whether or not an area has birds on it is, is to get up early, get up early, go somewhere and park and just listen for whistles. Um, and if you hear whistles out in an area, you know, there are birds there. You may not find them, but you know, there are birds in the area. So, so touch on that. It's not the traditional Bob White whistle you're listening for, is it? It's the covey, is it the covey call you're hearing yeah. or you both? Yeah. Yeah. I'm listening for just yeah, that. Those, those covey calls early in the morning. Yeah. Are with each other. If you're not familiar with that, look up Bob White covey call. It's not the traditional, you know, Bob White saying his name. So that covey call is really important this time of year. So Yeah. And and same thing with gambles. That's what, you know, Ben, I noticed that in, in Arizona and in New Mexico as well. It's like they're a vocal bird and you can, you know, you can hear them calling. And that's, that, you know, it, it's, it's kind of strange to use auditory cues as kind of a component of a quail hunt. But I, I picked up on that pretty quickly in Arizona that you can do that with gambles. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. It makes it, it makes it, uh, I, I, it adds a whole new dimension to it. Right. It makes it pretty dang fun. Yeah. Yeah, it does. And, and of course, you know, the, the running aspect of it, you know, I'm, I'm used to hunting scale quail and scale quail have a reputation of being runners, but I think that gambles give them a real run for the oh, money. Yeah. They, they, they are running little dudes. Yeah awesome yeah so um you know let's let's move down and and maybe chat about merns quick i saw there are a lot of people here interested in merns and and they're a super unique species uh especially in the fact that they are pretty isolated there's ice pretty isolated opportunities here in the u.s um most of the range resides down in mexico but we do have a few Few, few areas in uh, Arizona, New Mexico, and I think maybe even West Texas a little bit. Is that true? Well, th- they have a population oh. in West Texas, but you can't hunt them. Yeah. 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 Yep, exactly. Um, so, Merns, uh, I've I had the opportunity to do it. Chad, you've done it a few times now. Yeah, it's they're, they're just uh, such fantastic little birds. I just, I fell in love with them the first time I hunted them. I, uh, I you know, again, I you know, I have this pattern of trying to, to see if I can figure out on my own, you know, whether I can, I can actually find a birds before I actually go with someone who knows what they're doing. And the first time I went to Arizona was specifically to, to hunt merns. And, uh, and I went into it, you know, not really having done a lot of research, which is kind of like another pattern of mine. And, uh, I, I struggled for a day or two and I, you know, I didn't start finding birds until I started hunting places that had a, you know, decent amounts of grass 
but not too much that it was too thick. So elevation to it, you know, I basically, if I could find oak trees, you know, Gamble's oak, live oak, and and those areas underneath those trees where where the the Mern's quail could could dig for for tubers because that's you know a big component of their their yeah. diet. Um, that's where I would find quail, and uh, and that's what I did. I used Onyx. I, I keyed in on on national forest areas uh, in in you know southern Arizona, and found areas that had that mix of grass and oak trees and bare dirt underneath, and not too much not too much cover, enough cover to hide, but not too much that it was so thick that they couldn't move about. And, uh, and then I just, I let the dog out and I started walking and, uh, and that's how I found my, my Merns quail. You know, you, you get too low, you won't find them. You get too high, get too steep. Uh, you won't find them. Or if you do find them, you, you, you can't get to them. Uh, it's just, there's that sort of baby bears porridge area that I found that with that mix of grass and, and oak and, and, you know, bear dirt underneath. And, uh, uh and that's kind of what I keyed in on. Yeah, so like I, I, I think what you, what I'm looking for is like that fifty five hundred to like eight thousand, yeah. like mm -hmm. so, so basically like savanna grassland type habitat that that is not desert floor but not mountaintop, you know. Yep. Um, yep. I can I'm share my screen here for a second and I'll show you kind of so like this is this is kind of that that area that we talked about um you know you can see that there here's a little mountain it's it's going up here but these 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 washes and canyons here um you know working those edges you can tell down in the bottom there's there's a little bit thick cover but you know all interspersed through these trees is going to be you know that that grassy habitat yeah and those are those are typically bigger trees than you would see around where the gambles are right yeah, I, I do not find typically, I do not find gambles really keyed in on, on trees. They're more of like right. a bushland kind of species. Yeah. Um, but this is another important species like Merns, like we talked about before. You know, you have to, you have to um, do your research to figure out A, where they are. Because, you know, like I said, very isolated. So, you could be spending a lot of time hunting for nothing if you're not <laughs> if you're not uh, in the right areas. Yeah, and you can spend a lot of your time in areas that actually look good and and you know not finding mm -hmm. any birds. Uh, you know, merns are are very dependent upon seasonal monsoon rains, and and in areas where they have had that that don't get those those rains at the right time, you're not going to find nearly as many as many birds. Yeah, those diggings are, the diggings are very interesting. You know, I just hadn't hunted them before and just being able to kind of see that sign on the ground. And then of course, once you see one in person, you're like, Oh, I get it now. They got huge claws for, you know, yeah. for a bird that yeah. size. Yeah. And they're a really interesting bird. You know, they tend to, to have smaller covey sizes than, mm -hmm. than the desert birds. You know, I mean, I've seen some gambles coveys, you know, in, in Arizona that it's like, I, I always heard about the myth of the hundred bird covey till I actually saw one, you know, and it was a pretty amazing sight. Whereas, you know, Merns coveys, I rarely see any Merns coveys that are over like, you know, 10, 12 birds they are all typically smaller coveys and, yep. and uh, tend to hold really well for the dogs. Uh, they're just a, a fantastic like bird to hunt. Crazy well. The, like trust your dog. It's there somewhere yep. really, really well. <laughs> That's what I was amazed by. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, fantastic species. Love merns for sure. Uh, so we'll kind of touch on the last two species. We're running out of time, but we are – we are definitely going to do, do a, a whole webinar um, on hunting, you know, kind of the Pacific Northwest. Uh, actually, Chad and I are going to be heading up to that area, um, chasing after mountain and California quail up in the Northwest. So we've never done it before. So we are not the experts on <laughs> what to do. So apologize. That we will be after this season. Uh, I <laughs> will at least be dangerous. So Andy, you said you've had some, you've had some experience chasing uh, valley quail. Yeah, just, just once it's been years ago, but uh, valley quail near Boise and, you know, they live up to their name. They're in those valleys and those you know, sagey draws. And uh, we definitely found them down there. And then was talking with a couple, one guy with uh, forest service, one guy with park service this year and on fires out in 
in eastern Oregon even, which they're typically found farther west and a mountain quail are, but they were seeing birds, you know, eastern Oregon. Um, it's one of those birds once, that, well, I think once you get in the area that they are, they're not terribly tough to to take, but it's just kind of finding them. Yeah. So we will definitely dig in further on those species in the future here. Just, I could, I could give you some tips, but you're, they are going to be way off. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so let's, uh, let's get into some, some Q and a here, guys. We've got a lot of great questions from, from registrate from the uh, registration as well as some, some great ones in the chat here. Um, so let me, uh, let me pull those up and, and see what we've got here. Um, you know, one one question I, I like this um, was talking about hunting quail. So he's a again pheasant hunter. Uh, the question was, I'm a pheasant hunter and I want to get into quail hunting. Uh, what com compare and contrast that? And I'm assuming he's talking like between like you, you talked where those areas Iowa. Nebraska, Kansas, where they mix. Um, give a quick overview on, on you know, a how that habitat differs a little bit, and then also I'd love to hear your perspective on, you know, how you're hunting them oh. differently than you would pheasants. Yeah. So yeah, so I hunt a lot of areas where you're going to run into both pheasants and and quail, and although I'm primarily a quail hunter, I do shoot a few pheasants each year. Uh, one of the primary differences between hunting quail and pheasants in the in the plain states is is where you're going to find them. You know, um, you know, you'll and this kind of self evident. I mean, you'll find pheasants in you know the thicker CRP fields. They utilize that really thick cover that that quail won't. So if you're hunting a CRP field where you're just having to like break through you know chest high grass and and you know you're typically not going to find quail there. You're going to you're going to find pheasants. So what you need to do is kind of like get out of that pheasant mindset of like thick cover, cattail sloughs, things like that, mm -hmm. and look for areas that are sparser that may look, uh, you know, sparse to your eyes, but probably don't look sparse to a quail's eyes. Um, and, and hunt areas that are, you know, a little bit more native habitat, you know, not necessarily, native, but more grass, more shorter grass interspersed with brushy cover, you know, fence rows, things like that. If if it looks like a pheasant might not like that place, that means probably a quail probably would. Yeah. Um, you know, and and you know, things like, you know, I always I always key in on on Fords. You know, one of the things that I really look for are are areas with uh, like the prairie sunflowers, like areas of like old dead prairie stun sunflower stalks. If they're thick enough, they offer quail, it's really a good habitat. They offer quail a little bit of overhead protection from from raptors. Uh, and a little bit of security there, and also a food source that they can run around because that bear, that ground underneath them is a, generally a little bit more bare. So, so that's one of the, the key differences between between pheasants and quail. Another one is like it really in, you know, I mean, I think most pheasant hunters probably, and I don't mean to knock pheasant hunters here, but they kind of like engage in this like this sort of pheasant hunter shuffle kind of thing, and it's it's a it's it's a result of like having to to walk through heavy cover, right? You know, and and pheasants hold really tight. You know, quail, like if and if you're hunting with a pointing dog, I, I do this with pheasant hunters a lot. Like if you if you if you're hunting quail with a pointing dog and you're a pheasant hunter, and if the dog goes on point, you get up there. You know, it's like you you don't just like watch the dog and kind of shuffle on. I mean, bob whites will run. You know, uh, there's this this myth that bob whites are like a super tight holding, bo real gentlemanly bird. You know, they want to live, and uh, and and they will run if you don't if you give them enough time. And so, you know, timing is another thing that I think is is a, a little bit of a difference between pheasant hunting and, and quail hunting. For sure, yeah. You know, it, it seems when I'm quail hunting, it's, uh, I don't know, like it, for me, it's more a, a little bit more of a solitary sport versus pheasant hunters. Right, that's right? another component of it, yeah. You're not gonna have a skirmish line in, in, you know, when you're on a quail hunt. It's It mm -hmm. is definitely more of a small group kind of thing. And, and what I like to do is I will just, you know, cause a lot of the times I'm hunting what key pieces like key chunks of habitat like really spot on the spot type stuff like okay i'm gonna go here oh you know i'm gonna go to this spot this one this one this one um versus just saying you know anywhere in this 160 acres exactly there. that's that's a really right. good point you know it's like if you if you take a look at a 160 acre crp field surrounded by you know center pivots 
a pheasant could be anywhere in that. If it's a if it's a monoculture field, I mean, a pheasant could be anywhere in that field. And you know, so you you know you, you walk the whole field. Well, with quail, you know, they they key in on their transition zone bird, and so it's like you you key in on areas. You know, so you're much more targeted and much more focused when you're hunting quail than when you're hunting pheasants, especially in areas of of agriculture like that, where you're going to find you know those those areas of CRP fields versus you know areas areas of more native prairie. Yeah, for sure. Um... Here's a great question. I love to touch on this. You know, I, I saw a number of questions from people who are are new to hunting. So, you know, I'd love to hear your number one tip for a beginner to to be six. I guess I don't want to say successful because different definitions of success. But um, if you wanted to get into birds, what would be your number one tip you would give uh, a beginning hunter? Mm, for 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 specifically for quail. For quail, yeah. Yeah, and, and I guess it would depend on whether you had a dog or not. Um, <laughs> if if you have a dog, um, you know, again, get out of that pheasant hunting mindset and 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 concentrate on on brushier areas. Um, and I know it's kind of a nebulous response, but it's like if an area looks quaily, I hate using that term, but if it, if if you if you can analyze an area and if you can find you know a, a brushy cover component, if you can find uh, uh, an open cover, an open, uh, like a canopy with an open ground underneath it, you know, component. Uh, if you can find, if you can find those, those varying, you know, aspects or characteristics of a place, then I think that's the kind of place you'd, you'd find quail. You know, if, if you don't have a dog and you certainly don't need a dog to hunt quail, I mean, it helps. And mm -hmm. I think most people who eventually get in, who get into quail hunting will eventually end up with a dog. But I started out when I was a kid, you know, kicking up fence rows. And so if you don't have a dog and if you want to try your hand at quail hunting, look for the brushy stuff. You know, it's like you're you're not going to come out to Western Oklahoma and, and hunt a 20,000 acre WMA and, and expect to find quail out in the sand sage. But you can key in on on areas like creek bottoms, fence rows, shelter belts, look for loafing cover in the middle of the day. Quail have a tendency to to look for that loafing cover, you know, and, and in the middle of the day, which is basically, Andy, you can speak more to this as a biologist, you know, it's basically just areas of where they feel safe, you know, and they, they loaf around. And yeah. uh, that's, that, that is an identifiable component that you can hunt and that you can hunt without a dog. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think you, you mentioned loafing cover and it made me think of something that I couldn't remember earlier. When we think of pheasants and we think of cover or thermal cover, uh, we often think of winter thermal cover. They get in the cattails when it's really bad and it freezes. But quite often quail are actually looking for thermal cover from heat. They're looking for an area That's to great. get loaf yeah. in the in the midday sun um, where it's not super hot. There's a little bit of breeze. They're looking for those areas too. So that's another important component of that woody cover. But as far as a new hunter, I would say, I mean, yeah, it's a shameless pitch, but it's true. I, I would direct them to a quail forever chapter. Uh, I, there are people in those chapters that love to introduce new hunters to the sport. And, and most often they're doing it in the right way. Yeah, it typically is going to involve a dog, but you could go out and, and kind of see what that dog work looks like and get a good feel for it. Um, first without kind of committing to the you know 10 15 years of of uh the dog's life that you're going to have so I, I think connect with a network of chapters and we've got uh you know 150 plus chapters of quail forever 700 plus pheasants forever chapters a lot of those are hunting quail too so go out and check out those chapter people and and you know get involved in that network first and then actually i think that's probably the best tip that you could give to a new hunter is to get involved yeah. in a chapter yeah and they're they're willing and ready to talk to you. Yeah, that is, that is spot on. I mean, um, everyone that I, most people that I've ran into have been super helpful, right? Like if you're you're getting into and say, hey, I'm new, I want to go try it for the first time. You're gonna have a hard time finding somebody that says no. I don't want to take you, or I don't want to help you out in some way. So um, that's a great tip, very great. Um, my tip would be, uh, you know, if you, if you want to, it kind of mimics Chad's in terms of like going out to this giant piece of property, but it's finding smaller stop, smaller spots and failing faster. Yeah, right. Exactly. So you, oh. You're not, you're not going to 
you, you like you could go walk into this giant expanse and really not figure anything out versus you know even i'll drive around like on around pieces of public land and say okay that looks like hmm, like okay there those are the sand palm thickets they were talking about okay there's some bare ground here and there's some crop next to it like it might just be a little i mean acre patch that looks good get out go walk that okay dang i didn't find anything and then just kind of keep doing that until you find success right because yeah. Um, then you'll be able to see a number of different things and start to kind of create that mental image that you're looking for. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's fantastic advice. I mean, I, yeah. I learned something every time I go out, you know, whether yep. I find birds or not. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that ability to, I, mean, I, I hunt with my buddy Tim a lot and we're, we're pretty efficient. Like our ability to get in the truck, move to a spot, get out with a dog and check a new spot is like, to be able to make that turn pretty quick and just willingness to go do it, like spend 20 minutes walking a spot. And if it, if you don't move anything, go on, you know, move on. They're just not there. They're not there that day. There's little, and, uh, little snack size pieces of, of property. You know, yep. it's like, the, that's, that, that's a great way to put it is to fail quickly. Um, uh, because you know, and that's when I'm, when I'm hunting a new area, that's just kind of what I do is like, I will, it, rather than like, take in the whole area. I'll just like, I'll, I'll pick a, a spot. I'll pick an area and then I'll try to start picking apart that area. And if I don't find any birds in that area, well, then I'll find another place to go and then kind of pick apart that area. So like, you don't try to take it in one giant chunk. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. Um, here's a good question. And, and this is more, I guess, on the management side, but number of people asking, um, you know, what can I do to my property? And I'm assuming this guy is probably in the Southeast area. He said, you know, I grew up with quail, once had quail, I've, I've got some land. What can I do to help promote the, you know, bringing back those numbers on his property specifically? Okay. Uh, it, you know, not sure what state, but it actually doesn't matter. We're, we're growing our network of biologists by leaps and bounds. Um, we have about 65 biologists from let's say in the bob white range from texas oklahoma all the way around to virginia uh, and there are biologists in every southeastern state now and so um, you can email me uh, a edwards at quailforever.org and we'll put you in touch with a, a biologist in your area it's free for them to come out check your land out there's no size limitation on what you have but to be honest, if you got five acres, you're probably not going to have quail. But, um, you know, if you can get your landowners adjacent to you together and and just start managing it, one of the most common things we hear is that you we used to have quail, but we don't anymore. And uh, but it, but the land looks just like it did back then. And, and I'll ask, well, what what did you do to keep it looking the same? Because we get 50, 60 inches of rain here a year. And so it's it's growing up, even though you don't see it. And so, um, yeah we're we're that's kind of the the heart of the organization is habitat and so we'd love to work with you and, and so andy just out of curiosity like what are a lot of those you know what are a lot of the practices that you're implementing on the landscape the most common things sure sure we're we're working often with the government programs that are out there with the the federal farm bill programs and so we'll work um within those frameworks that we have, you know, conservation reserve program or environmental quality incentives program. But we also do, you know, we'll come out, make recommendations on the actual management practices to do. If you've got um, wooded land, we're going to often recommend that you thin it way down uh, and get sunlight on the ground. Then we're going to recommend burning to continually keep that in a state of what we call early successional habitat. And if you're curious about, and you want to nerd out on quail habitat, look up early successional habitat. That's if you took a plow in and just made it bare ground, what would come back in the first three to five years after a total, uh, you know, reset? That's what quail want. Um, that's what most quail want, quite honestly, but particularly Bob Whites. They, they are very early in that stage of, of reforestation or re- um, development of the, the the cover. So we're going to continually do that three to five year rotation and and create quail habitat through spraying or uh, burning. In the southeast, a lot of times we're not planting stuff because it can already be in the seed bed uh, if it hadn't just been farmed a whole lot. But um, yeah, a lot of 
a lot of things just to keep it in that early stages. For sure. Awesome. Um, looking here now to give some love to our, our Western quail hunters. Uh, this is a, this is a question that I learned the hard way on what to do and what not to do, but, uh, what are your tactics when you're hunting gambles quail? I can, I can see them running in front of me, but I can never find them or get them to fly. <laughs> oh, oh. Yep. This is probably not the right place to admit this, but the very first gambles quail I ever shot, I violated every safety rule known to man. I shot that bird at a dead run because I, I couldn't get it to stop. I mean, it was flying. Don't get me wrong. I, I didn't shoot it. Up, but it, I was like, I had to physically run after that bird yep. to get that bird to flesh to, to shoot it. I, it's just, it's hard. If they're in thin cover, they will run. I, you know, my poor dogs, they will track those birds for, it's like, like pheasant hunting to, to like on steroids. I mean, they, they, they will run for hundreds and hundreds of yards until they finally get to an area where they feel safe and, and, and you can pin them. Uh, and, and, get, and I've noticed that they are a lot like scalies and that they will tend to hold harder or hold better after a covey flush, whatever that covey flush may look like, maybe a rolling covey flush, for, you know, as you, as you chase them down. But that's just a, I think that's just a function of the bird. It is tough. And uh, uh, you yeah. just have to kind of keep, keep chasing them. I think really yeah. good. I think fast, fast feet, man. I mean, it's just, if yeah. you're not breathing hard, you're probably not moving fast enough. Yeah. For those suckers. Or try to get your dogs to, to break up the covey and hunt singles. Yeah. yeah. That's, what, that's uh, another tactic. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's kind of where I found a lot of success is, is a lot of the times when I'd get up to them, you know, they would flush, you know, they flush at 40, 50 yards the first time, break up, then able key in on, on those yep. pairs, especially. Yeah. Um, the first time I actually hunted them was off a of horseback. Mm. <laughs> and that was an interesting technique because you just run up on them and then let the dogs get to work. So, um, that was, I thought that was a fantastic way to go about it. Yeah. Yep. Someone in the comments mentioned that they have more success without a dog. And I think, I think unless you've got, a, I think that's probably true. You lose the fun of the work of it with a dog, but I just, it's tough for it, especially pointers, man. There, they just, yeah. it's there, tough there are a lot of guys that, that, that hunt them without dogs yeah. uh, and you can have success hunting gambles without dogs. Uh, it seems a little bit foreign to me. I, you know, I stubbornly oh, insist yeah. on taking my dogs, but but I can certainly see where it would be a, an effective te technique to hunt them without dogs. Yeah. Yeah. Especially like, you know, running broke dogs was interesting. Yep. So it, they would just stop on first scent and it would just, sure. you yeah. know, constantly yeah. where a dog that was a little unruly would go in there, break it up. And then, you know, you could work the singles. So, yep. Yep. <laughs> I yeah, can see where they can develop some bad I'm habits. Yeah. It's starting to remind me of pheasant hunting. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was about to say, I think of all the, the quail that I've hunted, gambles remind me most of pheasants. Absolutely. And I think if you can safely pinch them, and you know, if it's a flat enough terrain where everybody can see each other and you can get some guys around on the end of the draws, that would be successful. I mean, you no doubt. If you're, you know, if you can do it safely, just like we would do pheasants. Having your blockers. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Um, and, and I've found too that, you know, if you could get them into a little thicker cover, you know, if you could yep. kind of push them into a little thicker cover that they would, uh, they would definitely start to hold, you know, yeah. hold better yeah. versus like you were saying, Chad, that wide open stuff, they have a really hard time, um, not wanting to run. So, yep. let's see here. Um, Here's one. Let's talk about uh, the differences in early season hunting versus late season hunting. And I think probably these answers to them probably can be, uh, you know, utilized across different species, uh, at least mine is, but kind of what's your, what's your hunting strategy take on early season versus late season? Andy, you want to go first? No, have at it, man. <laughs> no. So, you know, obviously, you know, one of the, the big differences between early and late season hunting is, is going to be temperature. Um, you know, I, I find birds in, in areas that uh, are not as, as keyed in on thermal cover early in the season, um, you know, versus late season hunting. And also birds, you know, quite frankly, heavily hunted birds, is, you know, bobwhites too, do tend to hold easier uh, 
early, or, or hold tighter earlier in the season. You know, they don't have as much of a tendency to run, I think, as they do late in the season. Uh, it's just a generally, you know, you get a lot, shoot a lot of juvenile birds and early in the season, it's just an easier hunting, you know, and late season, the birds get educated. The birds kind of know what the game is. Uh, it's colder and they're keying in more on, on their, their food sources kind of get a little bit more concentrated. Uh, you know, they're kind of keying in on those like higher density foods. I see late season, I see a lot more, more quail in, uh, uh like wheat stubble and, you know, sorghum areas where they're going to have like a, a, a big payout for the least amount of effort, kind of like a big old bass, you know, just like they're, they don't want to move around a lot and expend a lot of energy. So I find I'm looking for areas that have like really thick cover late in the season uh, in close proximity to, to food, uh, you know, and I'll, versus earlier in the season where there seemed to be a little bit more dispersed. And that's probably my, my biggest difference between early season hunting and late season hunting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, mine has to do a lot with pressure, right? Um, so that's one thing hunting public land, you know, Kansas, Nebraska, Oklahoma, um, these birds, you'd be naive to think they're not getting hunted because right. they are. So, you know, it's finding those out of the way areas yeah. or areas that other people aren't will, you know, whether it's a small piece or a really large piece that people think like, oh, it's this, this tiny piece out in the middle of nowhere. I don't want to drive down there. So I kind of break my rule. Generally, my rule of thumb is when I'm looking for properties to hunt in general, um, I'm looking for multiple different properties that are close yeah. together. And actually in late season that, I mean, Chad and I were down there and, and honestly that kind of hurt uh, because that's what other people have. That's what everybody got, else does. Yeah. yeah. That's a, that's a great point. Um, like early in the season, and I guess it goes back to the whole, you know, easy versus hard kind of concept. Early in the season, I will not take a chance on those outliers. Like if I'm hunting wee hog ground in Kansas and, you know, and you know what I'm talking about, Ben, you'll see these concentrations of, of properties and, you know, early in the season, they hadn't been hunted as much. So yeah, you get in there and hunt them late in the season. There aren't as many guys that are willing to take a chance to make that drive on those more isolated properties. And that's when I, I start roaming. Uh, and fine and, and hunting, you know, early in the season, I'll run up to a property and it may not look great and I'll, I'll pass it up late in the season. I don't pass up properties that look questionable because I figure that every other person who's driven by this property has kind of done the same thing. Yep. Yeah. And it could be one, like on, on a property, it's like, I'm not hunting the whole property by any means. It's, you know, there is one objective there, you know, that might be all the way at the back of the property and people are like, yep. I do not want to walk back for that yep. little area. Per perfect example. Last year, I, I did a, a, a three state hunt for a story. I started off in Nebraska, hunted, hunt, then hunted the, the Kansas opener and then hunted Oklahoma. And I had my I had a little pointer pup at the time. She was she was younger and she, and she hadn't gotten her first birds yet. And uh, I, 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 I pulled up on a, on a, a piece of weehaw ground that had been emergency hay. You know, and it was just like looked like a golf course, except for one little strip of like interspersed sand plums and, and, you know, and grass going down the middle of it in a, in a tiny little, little ditch. Mm -hmm. And, it, you know, it, it take 50 yards or, you know, 15 minutes to hunt. I got the dog out and, and shot a few quail off of that because the quail were in there and got her first birds on that, like really marginal looking property. And, you know, you're not going to shoot a lot of birds, you know, but you're, you'll, you'll find them. Yep. I think a lot of times those grass waterways look pretty you know they're they're like a grass waterway that was put in years ago and it's grown up a little bit and yeah yep you know and another thing about. you know to, to that question uh i've noticed late in the season that quail and this specifically on public land will utilize areas that you won't normally find quail uh i <laughs> last year i flushed a covey of quail out of out of a cattail slough on a heavily wow you know, heavily hunted a piece of grass. Never seen that before in my life. I, you know, I, I, it was just, it was new to me, but it, 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 sh it uh, demonstrated to me that quail can adapt to pressure and quail can, can figure that out and, and adapt and go to places that you wouldn't normally find them. So, right. you know, late in the season, find those places that don't conform to the, the popular notions of where you'd find quail. Yep. So I noticed in the chat, what they're, they're answering it now, but Weehaw is walking 
walk-in hunting access. So it's Kansas's particular program. Uh, Oklahoma has OLAP and uh, Nebraska has pro- plots private land open to sportsmen. Well, that Nebraska oh, is open fields and waters. That's right. Open fields yeah. and waters. Plots is uh, North, think Dakota. North Dakota. North Dakota. North Dakota. Yeah. yeah. No doubt. Walking, and, walking uh, areas in South Dakota. So, um, but now Onyx has all those layers for each of those state state based hunting access programs. So it's it's private land that is publicly accessible. Yeah, exactly. Um, one more question here, and I wanted to touch on this for sure, just because. So I know for quail, for all of us, are are a super special species, and and obviously we want to be hunting them, you know, years from now. That's that's the goal. Um, this is more of an ethical question, but what, uh, you know, you, you get into a covey of quail, especially late season, like we were talking, you know, at what, at what point are you not shooting into those coveys? Like, it, you know, a lot of the times those birds will start what they lay like 12 to 14 eggs or something mm-hmm. like that. Yep. Uh, so, so where, where do you hold off and when are you not shooting into coveys? Any Man, uh, wow. You go ahead and take that one, Chad. That's a really nice one. Well, that Ben's yeah, throwing. I mean, that, that'll open up a whole other, you know. Yeah, there's, there's like and, six, and these yeah, are only, six pack of worms. These are strictly my opinions. You know, they're not based yeah. on any kind of like, you know, set in stone rules or anything. But I typically will not shoot birds out of coveys that have less than eight to 10 birds. If I, you know, if, if I, if I flush a covey of quail to six birds, I, I'm not going to shoot two birds out of that. I mean, that's not a covey anymore. That's just a, a couple of birds, right. you know. Um, and, you know, it, and so I have to be very aware of, of that, especially late season, you know, I mean, there aren't that many quail around that haven't been hunted, you know, there's, there, especially on public land, I, I, you know, there aren't any quail that hadn't been hunted on public land. And so by the end of the season, you know, those birds are carryover birds and it, it ca- kind of gets into the whole issue of like late seasons and, you know, how many, how many birds will will carry over to the next year and if you're late in the season if you're shooting those birds that are going to be brood birds in the in the spring so it's 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 a very complicated topic that get a lot of people uh, opinionated on but i typically you know i mean it's just kind of common sense for me as like if, if it's a small covey i don't want to shoot it i want to see that covey next year with a bunch of birds in it and if i if i just blow the hell out of that covey late you know it's not going to be here next year and i'm just cutting my own throat and throat of everyone else that wants to enjoy those birds you know, right. so I also think it kind of gets to the, the question of, of uh, you know, what constitutes success? You know, I mean, a lot of guys, a lot of people are, are really keyed in on limits. And I, you know, especially for quail hunting, I mean, we, we kind of have to get away from that. It's it, for me, it's I, you know, I mean, I can't remember the last time I shot a limit of quail and I quail hunt a lot. And and I, you know, it's it's not about that. And I think that if you if you key in on numbers of birds, you know, and I, I got to shoot this bird or I got to shoot these birds, then I think you're kind of missing the point. Uh, you know, I, I think the, the reality of quail hunting is that you're in it for, for the experience. You're not in it for the numbers. And if you find a covey of birds that are, you know, six to eight birds, I think that, you know, for me anyway, I feel that it would be irresponsible for me to, to shoot birds out of, of a covey that small. I think you're spot on. And I think we've, we're we're kind of benefiting from the sport is benefiting from a shifting baseline of success where it used to be. I know when, when my dad was, you know, out hunting, if they didn't come home with a limit, oh, it was like a bad day. And now uh, guys in anywhere, really not just here in Tennessee or in the Southeast, you know, you go out and you get some good dog work, you get on a few coveys, maybe you, maybe you just shoot the covey rise and uh, you come home with a few birds in the bag, man, it was a great day. And yeah. I think most people would say that same thing, uh, you know, from the diehard guys to the guys that just get a chance to do it two or three times a year, just being able to get, get dogs on coveys of birds is, is yeah. success. Yeah. That's- leave it to the biologist to use a biologist term, you know, but that's, it's a perfect way of shifting baseline syndrome. You know, it's like my reality for, yep. for quail hunting is, is not the reality of 20 to 30 years ago. That's right. And 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 so you have to adapt to that reality and you have to to kind of like you know re renegotiate your your terms of of what what constitutes yes. success mm-hmm. yeah yep. another good question to kind of follow up like i so i agree wholeheartedly. and the reason why i wanted to ask is just because it's important right especially on public lands you're leaving 
leaving birds to nest and then also for other people to hunt. Um, but to go, uh, kind of a follow-up question was asked, uh, how late in the evenings are, are you hunting on cold evenings or like even really cold days? Like, you know, I was out a couple of times in, in blizzards in mm -hmm. Kansas. Are, are you hunting and how late are you hunting on those, those colder days? And, yeah, and I think weather is a huge factor in that. But, uh, you know, if it starts to feel icky, man, you're done. You know, if it starts to feel like, holy crap, are we, you know, somebody's got to have some a moral compass that says, all right, we're probably. But I, I think a good baseline there is on a rough, rough conditions, even if it's just super cold uh, and calm and sunny, you're probably fine. If it's cold and nasty and there's precipitation at all, uh, I'd say couple hours ahead of ahead of sunset it's good um I, I i'm probably gonna piss some people off here I, I i'm i'm not a real big fan of the whole golden hour kind of thing um you know specifically for quail now i don't know how it applies to, to pheasants but you know quail like for example in oklahoma um you you can't hunt quail in oklahoma on public land past 4 30 i think it's a fantastic rule yep. you know i'm just like the, there, there's a lot of research to show, you know, busting up coveys late in the evenings reduces that covey's chance. I mean, it, it increases mortality, you know, regardless of weather, you know, as like, you know, it's, it's, it's not just about weather, it's a defense mechanism, you know, and so I, I, I typically try to, to, to stop hunting quail early to mid afternoon, and certainly, and since I hunt mostly public land, uh, not past 430, and I try not to do it, I you know, like for example, in Oklahoma on OLAP land, which is our walk-in program, uh, that that I don't believe I may be wrong, but I don't think that rule applies to to private land enrolled in walk-in that 4:30 rule. I still won't hunt past 4:30, uh, just because I I just don't feel comfortable breaking up those birds that late in the day, and especially later on in the season when there is that thermal aspect of you know the the survival mechanism of of, of coveying up. Yeah, exactly. and exactly. you know you, oh. we. We've talked about other species quite a bit, but they're not like pheasants. They're not like sharp tails. Yeah. Not like prairie yeah. chickens. They're not going to fly a long way to roost. They're they're going to roost on the ground, very close to where they're they're at at that time. Yeah. Awesome guys. Hey, we are we are at time here. So um, again, I I appreciate everyone that's on here that that followed along, and hopefully you learned something from it. Um, Thank you guys for, for, for jumping on Chad and Andy and, and helping and sharing your, your knowledge. I really appreciate it. And I hope the everyone out there appreciate it as well. Um, I look forward to uh, seeing you guys again soon and then, then hearing about your, your uh, upland gallivanting. So um, thanks again, everyone have a good night. If you miss some of this, uh, it's going to be up on YouTube tomorrow. You'll be able to, to, to rewatch it. So, um, thanks guys. And, and hopefully you have a successful season. Yeah. Thanks. Had a great time. Yeah. And I'll, I'll be seeing you in a while. Yep. Awesome. All right. Thanks a lot. Thanks, man. Y See y'all soon.